tonight on KQED Newsroom. A quarter of the crude oil that California imports comes from the Amazon. We talk with two environmental advocates about how fossil fuel extraction is impacting the rainforest in Ecuador. And Governor Newsom unveils a new plan for living with COVID-19 for the long term, while new poll numbers show that Californians are increasingly concerned about rising crime. We discuss it all with our panel of reporters and also analyze the results of this week's elections. Plus, an intriguing art exhibit about the health of our planet is this week's edition of Something Beautiful. Coming to you from KQED headquarters in San Francisco, this Friday, February 18th, 2022. Hello and welcome to the show. This is KQED Newsroom and I'm Priya David Clemens. We're focusing this evening on where California gets its oil and why it matters. The latest figures available show that about a third of the oil that goes to California refineries come from the state itself. Another 18% comes from Alaska. Nearly half of our oil comes from foreign sources. What may surprise you is that the largest source of foreign oil to California is in the Amazon. In 2020, for the first time, California imported more oil from Ecuador than from Saudi Arabia or Iraq. In fact, a recent report from our next guests show that California is the world's largest consumer of oil derived from the Amazon. Joining me now are Amazon Watch Climate and Energy Director Kevin Koenig. Hi, Kevin. Hello. And Stan.Earth Amazon Program Director Tyson Miller. He joins us by Skype from North Carolina. Hi, Tyson. Hi, Priya. So thank you both for joining us. First of all, Tyson, help us understand where and how this oil from Ecuador is being used in California. Yes, it's really shocking to see that California is responsible for about 50% of the oil exported from the Amazon. So that means that's equivalent on average to every one in nine gallons pumped in state is Amazon oil, is Amazon derived. In Southern California, it's even more. Every one in seven gallons pumped is from the Amazon rainforest. And LAX is the largest consumer of Amazon oil in the world in terms of airports at every, for every one in six gallons pumped. And citizens, corporate sectors, fleets, large brands are all connected. And um, it's a real issue that we need to get a handle on. Why is it an issue, Tyson? Where, let's just start with kind of the broad picture. Why are you concerned about this? Oil drilling in the Amazon is really the last place that crude oil should be coming from. And the, one of the major problems is that it's going to be expanding. And Kevin will get in, into that shortly. But it's one of the most biodiverse uh, regions uh, in the world. Um, and it's home to, to hundreds of thousands of indigenous peoples whose cultures are at risk from oil drilling. Also, the industry itself often is the, is the first industry to go into intact and let relatively pristine regions. So building that infrastructure to put in pipelines and the like. And so the first cut is the deepest. And um, that's what we really want to avoid is what's planned in Ecuador and in other places, which is to expand oil drilling to supply um, oil for U.S. demand primarily. Two thirds of all exports from uh, oil exports from the Amazon are, are going to the U.S. So Californians the lion's share of that. There's also nine other states implicated, even President Biden's home state of Delaware. All right. Well, you know, as Kevin just mentioned, Tyson, the president of Ecuador has pledged to double oil production coming out of Ecuador. You lived in Ecuador for many years as well. You were in mm -hmm. Quito, uh, the capital there. So tell us about what you witnessed during your time there, which was really the beginning of, of this really deep drilling. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, oil extraction in Ecuador, um, there, there's a crisis of contamination. A lot of the infrastructure um, in place is pretty much built to spill, right? We're seeing um, just this last January, there was a um, the second spill um, in the last two years, major spill. Um, but right now, the country's averaging two spills per week, right? So this is devastating the forest, and it's devastating the lives of indigenous people, right? Who are, um, they are the ones that are fishing in these contaminated rivers, so drinking water is coming from there, and they're using the forest, right, for their daily survival, right? It's their pharmacy, it's their supermarket. Um, so it's having a major impact. Um, we're seeing indigenous people that are also um, expressing concern and opposition to new extraction plans. Some of those leaders have been threatened. Um, and yeah, exactly, the government of Ecuador is planning to double production, right? So what does that mean? It means greater drilling in Yasuni National Park, right? Which is 
uh, UNESCO World Biosphere Reserve um, and home to indigenous people living in voluntary isolation. Um, the government is also talking about opening up 7.5 million acres of, you know, mostly roadless rainforest on um, entitled indigenous territory in the country's southern Amazon. This is all new exploration, right? These are new concessions that will be auctioned off. So um, California's consumption um, is really driving this expansion. And I think it's a, a, it's a sort of black stain, I think, on the climate legacy of, of California. And, and talk to me about the importance of the Amazon as kind of a biosphere retaining its essential properties. And what does that mean in terms of our need to control what's happening with global warming? And how does that play into it? Right, I mean, the, the Amazon basin, um, it, it's like the, uh, the global thermostat, right? It is driving weather patterns around the world. Um, and even studies talk about that rainfall that um, comes here to California is dependent on what's happening in the Amazon. So there's a real direct link, um, but obviously the Amazon basin is at a crucial tipping point right now, right? It's at this line where um, it, it, it is um, going to become a, a carbon source instead of a carbon sink, right? So it is a, it's, there is no um, climate stability um, on our planet without a healthy Amazon, right? And so um, what we're seeing, extraction that's happening, penetrating into these forests. Um, as Tyson mentioned, it's one of the worst places to be drilling from a climate perspective because you're looking for fossil fuels underneath standing forests, right, that play such a critical role in mitigating uh, climate change. And yet, at the same time, Ecuador looks at its resources and says, hey, we, we need to grow. We want to improve the quality of living for our citizens here as well. This is the resource that we have, and this is what we can sell to the rest of the world. We need, we need to do this. Ecuador actually, many years ago, tried to not drill, tried to find ways around drilling, which is interesting to see that foresight. Can you talk to us about mm -hmm. that time? Sure, I mean, this is back in 2007, right? And they were realizing they had a billion barrels of oil sitting under a, a really important part of Yasuni National Park. Um, and they said- and Let me just mention, for those who don't know, Yasuni National Park is one of the most biodiverse places on Earth. They have right. 655 different tree species, more than we have in all of North America, just trees alone. And yeah. that'll, not to say anything about the other fauna that they have there as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it is really one of the most biodiverse places. Um, and to think about drilling underneath, um, you know, as Tyson mentioned, I mean, the deforestation usually starts uh, with the entrance of the extractive industry into these places, right? So this proposal, the idea to the world was really a, a pioneer proposal, right? It, they were saying, look, um, we want to keep these, you know, these, these oil reserves of fossil fuels in the ground, um, but we need some help from the world to help offset our foregone revenue. Um, and then, you know, I think it was a, a, a revolutionary idea at the time. Um, unfortunately, the world did not step up in the way that it, that it needed to. Um, and I, my understanding from that time is that they said, the Ecuadorians said, hey, we have about $7 billion worth of oil in the ground here. If right. you don't want us to extract it, then give us a few billion, world, and help mm -hmm. us to keep it in the ground. And the world made commitments of about 13 million. Right. So plan B, drill. Right. And I think, you know, there's an interesting point here, though, I think, is that, you know, part of, I, I think it's important to debunk a little bit this myth that drilling for oil is the, the what's going to save, you know, Ecuador from its economic woes, mm -hmm. right? If you look back in the 60s when oil was first discovered, that first barrel of oil pulled out of the ground was given its own parade in Quito. It was blessed by the Archdiocese of the Catholic Church. It was going to be the panacea, right? Um, but I think over, you know, fast forwarding now to 2022, you know, that that model of, of dr trying to drill your way to prosperity one well at a time has not worked out. We see Ecuador at this point really trapped in a cycle of debt and dependency um, in large part because of its dependency on on oil. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think there a solution pathway does need to involve um, the you know, the I feel like northern countries here mm -hmm. who do. Um, I think owe an ecological debt to places like Ecuador, um, and they should step up and help financing a, a finance a transition um, away from um, from fossil fuels and towards a post petroleum economy. Well, you know, Tyson, I want to go back to you here. Ecuador is not a rich country, and as Kevin was just saying, they are billions of dollars in debt. This is to China. They need to raise money to become more financially independent and to improve their standard of living. Should they not be allowed to use their natural resources to grow their economy the way that developed countries have done for so many years? It's a great question. And I think that it's Ecuador needs to figure out 
solutions that will work to meet its economic obligations and also protect its cultural and natural heritage. And so, you know, you can look to other models from other countries where you've got country, countries that have kept their forests and their areas intact and been able to attract resources, payments for ecosystem services and other types of funding to keep the trees standing and to keep the, the forest intact. So there's, so which, you know, yeah. they, they could be which thinking about this. Would in, you in, suggest, in which countries would you suggest, which you suggest that we look at as a model? Historically, before Bolsonaro was in office, uh, a lot of resources came in to support keeping to stop deforestation and keep you know 80 percent of the forest intact and a lot of that funding was from uh, other countries and it was for sort of a payment for ecosystem services approach and so there there's also debt forgiveness itself so debt is a major driver of amazon forest degradation and, and the like and if countries like china um, and can forgive debt and or if the imf through special drawing rights or other mechanisms can also um, support debt forgiveness, it might make the president of Ecuador uh, choose a different path. Um, okay. And I think what's what's needed is instead of sort of, as Kevin mentioned, pursuing sort of these, these old models of uh, drilling your way to prosperity, which really hasn't happened in Ecuador, you know, maybe it's about finding other mechanisms, uh, like for a bioeconomy, for how the country can be a model for the world, uh, instead of opening up the last uh, vestiges of the rainforest and home to so many indigenous peoples whose cultures depend on, on them. All right. um, so, yeah. so Tyson, here in California, we are still oil dependent as a state. You know, we're working to transition away from fossil fuels, but we're not there yet. And so since we are still oil dependent, where do you think we should get our oil from, if not Ecuador? What are some better sources of oil? Well, I would first say that the, the, the state should prioritize not getting oil or expanding its consumption of oil from any regions where you've got that are the most biodiverse forests on the planet and where you have human rights violations. So, so many of the of the national and indigenous nationalities are opposed to uh, new expansion, new extraction. That'll be where the oil will be going to California. So, first and foremost, is how can the state put screens uh, on its its imports and re and refining approaches? Um, how can the governor uh, put some regulations in place for refiners? To make sure that these places are the are not being you know are, are not on California's uh, list for getting more oil. Um, in terms of your question, you know, I, I don't I don't know that I want to say, hey, here's where here's all the places where California should get its oil. I think California should focus on expanded EVs, expanded public transportation to reduce demand, um, and look at how to really regulate refineries to ensure that the refineries are not getting this oil from the, the last places on earth that that they are getting them from. <laughs> We're getting close to being out of time, but I do want to ask, you've been speaking, both of you, with the Newsom administration. Kevin, why don't you tell us a little bit about what actions you're requesting them to take? I mean, I think for starters, right, I mean, what, what, what we talked about, right, is that California does have an addiction to Amazon crude, and I think the starting place that we all know, right, is they need to admit they have a problem, right? So we want to see the governor um, recognize that there is some complicity in the role of California's consumption of Amazon crude, and then we need them to commit to a rapid phase out of, of crude source from the Amazon, for starters. Um, and I think there's a lot of things that people here can do also in California, right? We also need to call, there's um, major banks like JP Morgan Chase, like Citibank that are also actors in financing um, the extraction activity that's happening in the Amazon. And we highlight in our report, there's also um, a whole slew of companies, right? Whose transportation fleets here in California are using a tremendous amount of crude source from the Amazon. And that includes companies like Amazon.com and another a FedEx or a UPS. So there's, there's a lot of actors involved um, and we need to see action from all of them. Okay. Tyson, final thoughts from you on what you'd like to see happen from the state government or from residents. Well, thank you so much for covering this issue. I think my final thought, thought would relate to citizens uh, and their attitudes on this issue. So we've done citizen poll and we found that across America and also in California, that two thirds of, of citizens are concerned with oil, Amazon oil imports coming into the state and being complicit in, in oil drilling in the Amazon. And two thirds would be more likely to vote for elected officials who have taken action on this issue. So we're hopeful that Governor Newsom and, and governors from other states that are connected will step up. And really, this is a legacy issue for, for California, but also for the world. And hopeful that Governor Newsom will, will sort of take clear and measurable steps forward to address this issue. Okay. We want you to know, our audience, that we did make a request for representatives from the state's Environmental Protection Agency and the state's Energy Commission to join us on the show today, but unfortunately they did not make anyone available. We will continue to be in conversation with them.
All right, Tyson Miller with Stan.Earth, Kevin Koenig with Amazon Watch. Thank you both for joining us and for sharing this information today. Thank you, Preet. Thank you so much. This week, Governor Gavin Newsom released his endemic plan for California called Smarter. The plan lays out how to coexist with COVID safely going forward. The indoor mask mandate also ended for most public spaces for people who are fully vaccinated. This comes as COVID case numbers continue to fall sharply in the state. California's test positivity rate has fallen from 8% last week to 5% this week, according to state health officials. Joining me now are KQED politics and government correspondent Marisa Lagos and KQED reporter and digital producer Joe Fitzgerald Rodriguez. Thank you both for being here in studio with us today. Thanks for having us, Priya. Yeah, yeah us. so Marisa, you were watching Governor Newsom's announcement of the new endemic plan. He did it from San Bernardino. Tell us what That's else right. we should know. Yes, yeah, standing in front of boxes of thousands of masks. Um, you know, essentially this is a plan that they say is going to allow the state to sort of move forward into this next phase, um, but still be prepared for the potential of surges like the one we saw just a few weeks ago with Omicron. So from a practical perspective, Priya, it's not going to change anyone's life, right? It, this is really the, the government saying we have, are putting in place sort of a scaffolding so that if we have another variant, if mm -hmm. we have another surge, we're ready with masks, with healthcare workers, um, with you know, sentinel sort of tracing of wastewater, which has mm. become a really like good way to actually accurately tell if things are spreading. Um, and so at the end of the day, yeah, it's got a fancy name, Smarter. Um, I think the mask mandate ending and the question over what happens with kids and schools and masks at yep. the end of the month is probably what more average citizens care about. Right. Well, I mean, I'm definitely still seeing people wearing masks Everywhere. as they're going yeah. about their business in the, in the city, in the Bay Area, at least, right? We're still seeing that a lot. Joe, what are in you my noticing? my neighborhood, too. I'm seeing it all over the place. Yeah. But, you know, it, as far as businesses are going, you know, even my own barber <laughs> just this week was telling me, oh, thank God, you know, I don't have to worry about all this masking uh, soon enough. But other businesses, you know, I'm seeing on social media posts from businesses having to remind their customers, hey, we actually want to have you masked in our spaces still. And that's interesting because, you know, they, they were really looking to the state and to counties to kind of giving them backup to say, we are the reason that we're masking. And they could point to that. Now it's a little bit back to that kind of it's each up to each individual business and store, and we'll see how that develops. All right. Well, there is a new poll out of the uh, UC Berkeley's Institute of Governmental Studies, right, IGS poll that came out, saying that people are less concerned about the coronavirus. That's starting to fall off, but there's increasing concern over rising crime in the state. And Marisa, you've been doing a lot of reporting about this. Yeah. So tell us what you're seeing. I mean, it's so interesting, and it's not surprising, right? We have seen a really staggering increase, 30% increase nationwide in murders during 2020. Yeah. So there is no question that violent crime did increase during the pandemic. It seems to have sort of leveled off in 2021. But I've been doing some reporting looking at whether, you know, that is, say, caused by progressive policies or progressive district attorneys. Um, and the truth is, when you look at sort of per capita, say, murder rates across the state, they've gone up more significantly often in rural conservative counties mm. than in places like Los Angeles and San Francisco, where the DAs are facing recalls. So, so that seems very counter message. It is. But I mean, it's a hard argument to make to people who don't feel safe, right? And the bottom line is, if you're the victim of a crime, if you know people who are, or quite frankly, if you're watching media coverage that picks out individual stories, it's very easy to feel unsafe. Um, when I talk to criminologists, they say that there's probably a really wide range of reasons that this uptick happened. Um, but what's true is that it happened across the nation. It happened in rural um, and big cities. Um, of course, we always see more crime in big cities. There's more people. But it, it, this is not necessarily one that you can sort of follow along easy political lines. But that's certainly the message we're hearing from opponents of people like the governor, uh, the DAs, and others. Okay. So this week, Phil Ting, Assemblymember Phil Ting, put out some new legislation, Joe. This is specifically addressing hate crimes and uniformity in reporting hate crimes because that varies from place to place. Well, we've seen this uptick in reporting, especially with Stop API Hate, which really, you know, out of SF State and uh, nonprofit groups, really bringing to the fore reporting that we hadn't seen happening. Mm. Bringing forward reporting of so many uh, rising anti-Asian hate crimes from people being spat at to beaten and even just discrimination in the workplace just over the pandemic with all the kind of rising sentiment towards the Asian community. We've really seen them struggle with that. And that, that also ties into what we're talking about with the, with the DA, mm -hmm. with Boudin, with the recalls in general, because we're seeing this kind of this targeting of that community. And we're really seeing a community trying to push back in all sorts of different ways. 
I was just talking with a, a police commissioner, San Francisco Police Commissioner Larry Yi today. He also was a past president of the Chinese Six Companies, one of the oldest, uh, 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 one of the oldest groups in San Francisco trying to help uh, the Chinese community dating back to the time of uh, 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 San Francisco's first founding. Hmm. And he was pr telling me, like, you know, it's, it's Chase's time to prove that he can actually help the community. We got folks who are feeling, like Marisa is saying, you know, whether the stats back it up or not, we have people who are feeling as if they are under assault. And with the Asian community, they absolutely have been. So what is being done to help them? Now we've seen Chase in particular uh, uh, make this kind of community unit inside of his uh, inside of uh, the DA's office, trying to address uh, the Chinese community in particular. He's hired some prominent members mm -hmm. of the Chinese uh, community, uh, uh, some people from a Democratic club, and people who have really done years and years of service in there. I was talking to Larry. Larry goes, "Well, hey, that's a few people, a few hires when you've got a city that is so majority uh, Chinese and Asian, mm -hmm. what is being done to help people, really what it amounts to for them, and what their concern is, is seeing um, uh, seeing things happen to folks who perpetrate okay. crimes. Okay, well, you know, you bring up Chase Boudin, San Francisco District Attorney, and he certainly had his eye on the recall election that happened this past week, where the three school board members did get recalled. Right. Marisa, is this a harbinger of what's to come for him? Are there are larger lessons that we should be looking at for Democrats more broadly? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. I think the, the conversation around AAPI hate is actually very relevant because what we did see in the recall was a lot of activation among the Chinese community against these school board members uh, for things that went well beyond the sort of pandemic closures that maybe launched some of the signature gathering in that recall, right? Uh, concerns over admissions policy changes to Lowell, the elite public high school in San Francisco, um, and some others. I think there's a couple lessons here. Um, I think that Chase Boudin's recall, like maybe should take some lessons from this, maybe not. There are different issues. I think more broadly what this does show is that, you know, constituents are angry right now if they do not feel heard. And whatever sort of political background they're coming from, whether it's the recall of Newsom, whether it's the recall of these school board members, um, I think people have been really activated over this pandemic time. and. You know, I don't think that the Fox News take that this means the end of the Democratic Party in right. San Francisco is right, but I do think that it does show that people want competent public servants, um, even if you know there's disagreements over some of the policies and and the priorities. Okay. Well, let's turn to another race, Joe. You have been following the um, assembly seat for David Chu that he um, left vacant when he came here to the city again. Uh, so we have two people who are headed to a runoff now, right? Yeah. Former San Francisco Supervisor David Campos, current San Francisco Supervisor Matt Haney. Tell us a little bit about what they each offer to the state more broadly if they were going to take Yeah, this I mean, it is important to know. I mean, these are two figures who are really well known in San Francisco and have been figures in San Francisco for quite a while. We, we know their positions a little bit here, but it really is worth mentioning that, you know, David Chu was a someone who really defended tenants on the state level. He was really chief in, uh, in negotiating for folks, um, uh, uh, for tenants in particular, uh, during the pandemic to make sure that there were uh, restrictions on evictions. Uh, and, you know, he, he played a central role in that alongside the governor. And so when we're talking about who's going to take that seat, we're really also talking about who is going to speak up on behalf of tenants in a place where San Francisco politicians have normally played that role. That's a reason why the region really should have an eye on this seat as much as San Francisco does. So last week we were talking about mountain lions in the South Bay. This week we're talking about feral pigs all over California. All over California, Priya. This is a problem in apparently 56 of the 58 counties. They're breeding like crazy. Five to six piglets at a time, twice a year. They're ripping up They're, vineyards, yeah, which soccer is fields. A huge wine. problem <laughs> for <laughs> the agricultural and other like ranchers. Yeah. Um, and so Senator Bill Dodd wants to allow more hunting of these pigs. We will see. Everything creates a fight in California. Yeah. So we'll see how that bill goes. All right. Joe, any final thoughts here? Oh my God, the pandemic's bringing us hawks, mice, coyotes, and now feral pigs. What's next? <laughs> All right, we'll keep a pin in that and figure that out as time goes on. Joe Fitzgerald Rodriguez, Marisa Lagos, thank you both. Thank My you. Pleasure. Within San Francisco's reimagined Cliff House is a new art exhibit titled Land's End, and it's this week's look at something beautiful. The installation examines humanity's relationship with the environment through multiple works of modern art.
The exhibit is organized by the Foresight Foundation. Check it out before it packs up on March 22nd, and you can also read our review of the show at kqed.org slash the do list. Last week, you may remember, we featured a field of flowers going through a super bloom. It was a beautiful sight, but viewer Glenn shared with us some concerns about what he saw. He wrote, I was very upset to notice that everything in those blooming fields on this evening's show is a problematic invasive. When invasive plants crowd out the natives, they remove the food sources of native pollinators, whose loss deprives the creatures who eat them of their food, and so on. For a future Something Beautiful, please show a meadow with the even more gorgeous native flowers, which will be in bloom very soon. San Bruno Mountain will be a good place to look, as will some of the painstakingly restored grasslands in Pacifica. Thank you, Glenn. If you'd like to share your opinion, email us at knr at kqed.org. And if you want to get a look behind the scenes, then please hang out with us online too. KQED Newsroom is on Twitter and Facebook, and you can reach me on Twitter at Priya D. Clemens. That's the end of our show for tonight. Thank you for joining us. We will see you right back here next Friday night. Have a great weekend, everyone.